This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is a, the clinical professor uh, in the Division of Plastic Surgery. Uh, he is a plastic surgeon by training, uh, now retired. He is also the um, past president of the American Board of Medical Specialties. And uh, I will mention that his uh, campaign not that he was singularly responsible for this, but his campaign while he was president at ABMS was to really push forth the maintenance of certification movement. And so I think that was really a, a wonderful step forward for American medicine. And uh, this has been a flag that uh, Steve has been carrying uh, for quite some time. We are lucky that uh, he decided to, uh, to retire uh, to Southern California. Uh, particularly just north of uh, San Diego, and he is uh, now involved with the PACE program, uh, counseling, giving insight, and involved in the evaluative process. Uh, Steve uh, has done a good job in um, combing the literature and is uh, going to be presenting the effects of aging on clinical performance, uh, what we know and what there is yet to know. Steve. Thank you, David. For full disclosure, uh, David has already told you I'm a physician, I'm retired, and what you may not know, even looking at me, is I'm old. Uh, and the way you could have told that is, unlike Peter, I didn't hop up the steps here, but Peter's my hero that he could do that. Um, David, that was such a lovely um, introduction. I have to say that it reminds me of a quick story, and since I don't know if everybody's in from outside, a story about William Howard Taft. And he was giving a discussion at a Chautauqua meeting in upstate New York and was to be introduced in the middle of July. Everybody is sitting outside waiting for this, the president to talk. And their speaker is a very famous orator of the time named Chauncey Depew. And Chauncey Depew has gone on now for an hour and a half in the baking sun. Everybody's very uncomfortable. And he finally says, I'd like to introduce to you our president, a man who is pregnant with wit and pregnant with wisdom, William Howard Taft. Those of you who knew or can reflect on what Taft looked like realized he was a large man. <laughs> he went up to the DS, holding on to his girth, looked out at the audience and said, <clears throat> if I'm pregnant and it's a girl, I'll name it Martha Washington Taft. If it's a boy, I'll name it George Washington Taft. If on the other hand, it's merely gas, Clearly, I'll name it Chauncey Depew. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think we can go on and look at, w when, when I got this um, assignment, so to speak, uh, I, I ended up writing a cousin of mine who, Dr. J if Dr. Jesty was here, he'd be pleased. He's a 94-year-old retired astrophysicist who has published four or five books and I don't know what else. He has just completed a book on successful aging, and it was mind-boggling to me. So I took this, what he said, and I said, what does that mean for the clinician? And I've discussed this with Bill. I've been involved with ABMS and physician evaluation. I am currently involved, uh, learning a lot at the PACE program. Do we know enough to know about clinical performance? <clears throat> and I know we're talking about the aged, but as everybody has been up here talking about it, I thought of all the other risk factors involved, and I hope to go through some of those with you. One profession, 
which has looked at age and deals with age as it reflects their performance has been the pilots. So let's look at what pilots do or what pilots must do. All pilots have to maintain currency. They are examined on an annual basis. All pilots who wish to fly a plane go through a simulation in that plane. It is a simulator, and I've actually done that on occasion. And all pilots need a medical examination. If they're under 40, it's only once a year. If they're over 40, it is every six months. Now, there was a study, and I originally make no claim to being um, the one who found this because I think it was my uh, friend and mentor, uh, Bill Norcross, who found it. It was a National Transportation Safety Board study done between the years 2000 and 2004. And I'm always looking, I'm always a skeptic. Uh, people who know me say I've aged successfully, but I'm still skeptical, whatever that means. But basically, this was a study involving all pilots. So it involved people like me who once flew, or recreational, corporate pilots, commercial pilots, and transport pilots. And what they found out was that 15% of all pilots were over the age of 60, and they accounted for a significant number of aviation accidents. As you know, back in the mid-2000s, they changed the mandatory retirement age for pilots. They changed that. And a subsequent study done between the years 2007 and 2009, the early indications were that changing the mandatory retirement age to 65 did not, did not affect patient safety. I thought that was very interesting. What I thought was even more interesting, though, is what pilots have to go through. And I think this is my impression of what physicians go through, at least in the United States. All physicians must maintain a generic license to practice, and they are called physicians and surgeons. There are no national standards for licensure. There is no assessment of competence, currency, or quality performance required in the area or scope of a physician's practice. In my view, physician competence and performance data is scant, is incomplete, it is of little use to the profession in general, and even less to the public. Now, I've just set up the dichotomy of my thinking, should there be age-based retirement for physicians? Obviously, my initial thought was, of course there should. We know aging reduces the quality the quantity of contributions, or do we? There should be a set ma mandatory retirement age and almost end practice at a certain period of time. And in the case of surgeons, they must all stop operating at a specific case. These issues have been addressed. There are people who firmly believe that. On the other hand, that's why one should not be a two-handed economist, because we always have two hands. But on the other hand, age may be a risk factor but it is not, by any means, the only risk factor. Now, when we start to look at other areas, other people, other specialties, uh, Paul Dirac, who was a very young Nobel laureate, did his research at age 26, has written this about age is, of course, a fever chill that every physicist must fear. He's better dead than living still, and once, once he's passed his 30th year. So. We've all looked and heard about the incredible contributions, certainly in the social sciences, in artistic work, by people like Mozart, Shelley, and people say, well, look at all these people and what they've done. They've made enormous contributions. But they didn't live to be older. So what might they have contributed had they lived to be older? So I've taken a, a group, and you've seen some by the other uh, speakers and looked at some older people who have contributed. So if we go down to the left lower corner and you look at Pablo Picasso, you look at Grandma Moses, there's Warren Buffett, the famous Michael DeBakey. 
By the way, uh, Dr. Perry, these two ladies are not a hundred running a marathon, but they're in their 90s and they're competing in a senior in a, in a senior um, Olympics like. There's Bill Cosby, the senior uh, George Bush, who still jumps out of airplanes to celebrate his birthday. Brett Favre, I guess I'll have to be a little, you know, maybe he did go a little beyond. For those of you who can recognize, there's a very famous neurosurgeon at the center portion and an equally famous plastic surgeon who, when he retired, was given this photograph of what somebody thought I would be doing when I was retired. None of that's true, by the way. So there is the wisdom of the ages and the wisdom of the age. We know that Aristotle, this series of philosophers here, Aristotle said that aging is a changing balance between the imagination of youth and the knowledge that the age has. Gene Cohn, who is a very well-known gerontologist, feels that there is something called developmental intelligence, where there's a maturing of cognition, of judgment, of emotions and social intelligence, life and spirit experience and consciousness. My all-time favorite philosopher, though, is Satchel Paige, who said, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you was? Now, we've all seen or heard that growing old is better than the alternative, but we reflect on that as the meaning death. That's not true. I think that growing old is better than the alternative, providing, and this is the major caveat, that one is still growing. And we have seen that. Dr. Jesty and many other people have discussed the plasticity and growth of the human brain, even with aging. Another problem I have is as we go through what we're doing and make decisions, averages tend to gloss over levels of performance, both good performance and bad. And the other issue I want you to reflect on is when judging decrements in performance, creativity, and contributions to society, which might occur with aging, one must also consider the baseline from which the individual began, began that decrement and the rate of decrement. And it's not the same for all people. Now, one of the uh, really nice articles by Strobe and the American Psychologist showed, this is an article dealing with um, academic performance, mostly in Europe. He showed that past performance is a far better indicator or predictor of scientific productivity than is age. And individuals who are very productive in their 30s tended to be much more productive in their 60s and 70s, 70s. That one of the reasons that people tended to be less productive in societies which mandate retirement ages and which decrease research grants was because of that reason, not because they might not be productive. He also had an interesting comment that, well, Nobel Prizes are often given later in someone's life. It's for work done earlier. But one of the truths is we usually do have not given Nobel Prizes to people who are dead. We usually don't repeat Nobel Prizes for people who might, in fact, at a later age, have done something worthy of a Nobel Prize. Now, my predecessors up here have discussed all of these, and I don't want to go into each one of these. But basically, these are some of the changes which can occur when we, age, when we age, and which may affect clinical competence. But I want to bring up these other issues because I don't think that competence and competent performance is solely a factor that we deal with in age. We do know, for instance, that students who do poorly in medical school tend to perform poorly through much of their practice years. We know that people who are in solo practice that is a risk factor. People who lack hospital privileges, that's a risk factor. In spite of the examination concept uh, of ABMS board certification, actual certification or lack thereof is associated as a risk factor. Another risk factor is out of scope of practice. The person trained as a psychiatrist who now decides to do cosmetic medicine or the person who is trained as an obstetrician doing something totally unrelated to obstetrics with really no training. 
That is a, a risk factor. Clinical volume is a risk factor, too much and too little. New knowledge is necessary, the development of procedural skills. One of the problems is we don't have a good way, nor have we ever, of discerning when someone is competent at new procedural skills. And what we have done, and there's no better example than the use of laparoscopic surgery, the learning curve was extraordinarily steep, and it was steep for the young and the old. There's also fatigue, stress, and burnout. And finally, a very favorite one of mine, which we don't seem to pay much attention to, there are health issues, both mental and physical. One of the things which I'm interested, Laura, in the question you asked Dr. Jesty is, I'm not so concerned about the younger generation because I think there's an element of living life a lot differently than some of us who are very old lived life. And I'm not so sure as I reflect back on practice that I did everything I might have done as well as I could have done, certainly as a father and a husband in a lot of other areas. Well, uh, you've seen some of the work by Kevin Eva. This is, uh, and I don't want to go into this in great detail, other than to say that Eva's work, a lot of which is based on stuff that Jeff Norman did, a lot of it is based on uh, material that Erickson did, is can the older physician be taught to abandon first impressions and use more analytic reasoning? Can you, with an older physician, develop a concept similar to what we do in the operating room, time out. Before you jump to conclusions, time out and think about the problem. The other thing I'm convinced about is that older physicians, younger physicians, all physicians need to have objective fear or objective peer feedback in what they're doing. And one of the best things for those of you who have not had an opportunity to read it is an excellent article in, I think it's this month's Is It New Yorker by Atoll Gawande, where he subjected himself to having an older surgeon, Bob Osteen, come in the operating room and watch what he did. And I thought that was an incredible idea, a great idea. The problem is I can't imagine many of us willing to accept that. Now, this study when I was at the ABMS was this was the study of studies, got everybody very upset. So Chowdhury and his, and his compatriots looked at knowledge. They looked at the adherence to standards of care, adherence to standards of diagnosis, treatment, and healthcare outcomes. They discovered or, or presented that 52% of this meta-analysis they did had negative outcomes, negative associations. 21% had negative associations for some outcomes, 13% no association, and 2% positive association, 62 studies. Well, what did they really find out when you read through the studies very carefully many, many times, as we did at the boards and subsequently? Well, knowledge data, test for knowledge, was consistent and was negative. So one of the questions, did that mean that the older physician didn't have current knowledge? Or is it possible that there was a question about the validity of the test used and the questions used? Did they really reflect the person's practice? Outcome data was far less consistent. The other thing to recognize is Chowdhury's study was based on some 30 year span of articles, a lot of very small studies. And the question was, some people who subsequently evaluated that looked over the last five to 10 years of the study and did not find such negative outcomes. They were suggesting better outcomes. So I don't know what, what to make of Chowdhury's study beside the fact that it's there and it does have certain suggestions, but it in itself, in my view, doesn't totally answer the question. Now a similar study was done by Rand, and maybe this is what somebody was referring to, and for the person who asked the question about females. The Rand study looked at 124 process measurements, or guidelines, across a broad range of clinical areas based on the Rand Quality Assurance Tool. 
and it was determined that this was a valid study by four panels selected by uh, RAND, and it was based on claims data. The overall performance was highest in women when they were board certified and when they graduated from a domestic medical school, but the overall effect was very small between the very best and worst. There was no association in this study with age, but it did, look, but it did not look at test scores or hypothetical scenarios. Now, another group of studies is the difference between relative and absolute figures and what's clinically important and what's statistically important. One of the studies which has been brought up by a very good friend is John Norsini, which showed in a study that he did when he was working at the American Board of Internal Medicine, a 0.5% increase in mortality for every year since graduation. Well, evaluation of the study, in fact, and looking at weighted figures showed that, uh, that that was a relative risk and not an absolute one. When one looked at the absolute one, as was done by uh, Jeff Norman, Kevin Eva, and several other people, in fact, the absolute increase in mortality and his outcomes was 1% over 20 years. And in a subsequent study, looking at the same type of information, there was no significant difference. I'm always fond of remembering what Gertrude Stein said as we look at statistics, which are important, that we also keep in mind that a difference to be a difference must make a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, I am a surgeon. I'm very concerned about surgical uh, competence, but I'm very concerned about surgical competence in everybody, starting from residents all the way up. We have, a, most of the studies that I'm aware of that were done recently are the studies out of the University of Michigan. All of these studies virtually are out of the University of Michigan. And they looked at the cognitive function and age in surgeons, and they used the CANTAB group. They found that the majority, 60% of the active senior surgeons, performed at or near the level of their younger peers on all cognitive tasks, as did 50% of the retired surgeons. Well, it's very nice to look at a cognitive test, but that's not performance where it counts. Where does it count for a surgeon? It counts in the operating room, generally speaking. So another study out of the University of Michigan, this one by Walji, much, much larger than the study by other groups and individual studies, looked at 460,000 patients selecting eight major relatively complicated operations. They're all listed here. For five of the operations, there was no age-related increase in, in mortality based on, on uh, their study. There was an increase in mortality for surgeons over age 60 in the following three operations, pancreatectomy, cabbage, and carotid surgery. People said uh, when they discussed this article that, well, obviously these were the more difficult ones, but other people have clearly said there really isn't a lot of increased difficulty between a pancreatectomy and an esophagectomy, so that wasn't true. But what they found out was what we have known about a lot of other things regarding surgery. These differences in age went away, or for the most part were dissipated, based on how much surgery or how many of these operations the surgeon did. That is, with increasing experience, they did better. It's not really something which shouldn't necessarily be very obvious for a simple task like riding a bike, you always know how to ride a bike. People who do lots of pancreatectomies tend to do them better than people who do one or two a year. Now, one of the things which has always, always concerned me is the loss of what I feel has been the professional contract, at least in this country. We are self-regulated. Medicine has been granted a substantial societal privilege and return is expected to set standards for entering practice, for sustaining the privilege to practice, and for sanctioning and removing from practices those who neglect or abuse that privilege, I might add, regardless of age. Now, one of the problems with this self-reporting is that 
Uh, a study by Campbell in the Annals of Internal Medicine showed that 96% of the physician re responders agreed that impaired or incompetent physicians should be reported to the appropriate authorities, but that 45% had encountered this and failed to report this to, uh, or failed to report incompetent colleagues. Now, some of the characteristics of aging which may affect clinical competence, what we assess today, generally within uh, PACE, we tend to look at things based on ABMS, ACGME competencies. Many of you don't realize that these were jointly developed. So we look at medical knowledge. And we can generally look at medical knowledge, uh, medical choice, uh, medical multiple choice tests, oral exams, OCEs, et cetera. But I always wonder when I'm looking at someone who is 60 as compared with someone 30, do, does that test really reflect the practice of the person being tested? If we use normative standards, upon whom are the normative standards based? When we look at patient care, what we often fail to do or be unable to really do is to look at real performance, both in the, um, in the examination room and certainly in the operating room. We already know the problems we're having with practice-based learning and CME. And so one of the things we say is when physicians don't use new information as well, why don't they? Are they not accepted? Did they not learn it? Did they not learn it and inculcate it? I don't know the answers to these things. I am sure, though, that uh, these factors are very important, ultimately, in competence. We do know that interpersonal communication skills are very important, but do we have a good way of assessing their random nature and their validity and reliability. And the same for professionalism and the same for systems. So I come to the conclusion that we do a lot which is necessary. We evaluate cognitive knowledge. We evaluate neuropsychological testing. But what we do is necessary, but I don't feel it's yet sufficient. I use this same Turnbull slide everyone else has used, but I use it for a different purpose. I use it because when competency is questioned, it is incumbent upon the profession to evaluate that person further. And I use that as just the medical model. When you see somebody who has an abnormal physical finding or an abnormal uh, test, you need to go further and dig more deeply to find out what the problem is. And what was found out here and what we often find out is that people have cognitive difficulties, mental problems, health pro physical problems, which are affecting their ability to practice safely. So somebody said to me, okay, so what do we need to know? What are some of the ideas and who's going to find out? Well, I think what we need to know is that we need to be utilizing a public, private, uh, uh, a public and private um, way of, of evaluating what people are doing. We need both. We need to evaluate, in my opinion, the mental and physical health of physicians on a regular basis and we need to increase this in frequency, in frequency after age 55 or ever, whenever illness develops. And neuropsychological testing is done as necessary. We need to develop reliable, reliable assessments of actual performance or the reliable and relevant proxies for performance which measure outcomes or processes that impro produce important and desirable outcomes and provide feedback to those who are who are performing these in order to document change and improvement. I'm very fond of asking that the local organization or f institution that a, phys that a physician belongs to be responsible for recredentialing on a meaningful basis that physician's competence and performance on an annual basis. I think that relicensure based on the scope of practice 
on the scope of practice should be done every two years. And that recertification, which is really maintenance of certification, should be on an every three year basis. From the standpoint of technical and procedural skill, I think we need to be able to use simulators. They are there. There are, I've seen lots of different surgical programs having them. There's a very large simulation lab now which just opened at UC San Diego. We need more of these. Uh, Bill raised the issue of robotic surgery and somebody saying older people didn't do well. Uh, I don't know of any specific study that has looked at older people, taken the skills that you've used in the simulation lab, and in fact documented that they really are significant. I don't know. I think that has to be done. I think that technical and procedural skills need to be specialty specific, need to be based on a practice profile, and these need to be done regularly, especially, especially if illness has ensued. So should there be retirement, uh, age-based retirement for physicians? You've seen this before. I don't think so. I don't think so because you've seen Dr. Jesty uh, yeah, and Dr. Perry, and certainly myself, have shown that older physicians have a lot to offer. Uh, there is going to be a major shortfall uh, of physicians as the population ages, as the population of physician ages. That does not mean, and I am not saying, that people who are incompetent and incapable of good performance should be allowed to practice. But perhaps they can be uh, uh, re, re um, learn how to do other things. They can become mentors. They can do other types of practice if they're retrained. We don't want to lose the contributions of medical wisdom and experience that someone like, for instance, myself and a lot of colleagues, an older person. I mean, I may be older, but I don't necessarily think I'm incompetent. Maybe I'm incompetent to do certain things, but other things I may not be. There's an incredible economic loss to discarding the wiser, older person, if you think about it. Society has paid an awful lot for our education. I think we all have to beware the law of averages. Old does not necessarily mean incompetent. Age is and may be a risk factor, but it is not the only one. And finally, the Age Discrimination Employment Act definitely comes into being. Now, for those of you unaware, the one group of professionals who has been unable to challenge that constitutionally have been pilots. That has never been accepted. So whatever the FAA says, that's the law. And finally, I think it is critical that we learn how to evaluate competency and performance well. And I'm told constantly, I gave a talk last week, it's impossible, it's too hard, you can't do it. I'm very fond of the Chinese characters here which basically say, those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. Thank you. So we have time for some uh, questions. Yes, please come to the microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Hetty Chang. I'm with California Medical Board. I'm also a board member for the uh, Federation of State Medical Board. Uh, a while back, we, I was studying, you know, the Federation is doing the maintenance of licensure initiative very strongly. So, but before we get that, I had uh, obtained a uh, study from the PACE program and asking about the differences between uh, the competence of the, uh, the age, uh, well, APMS, actually, the specialty. Uh, I remember a paper, because I'm getting old, I can't remember who wrote it. Uh, but um, the paper basically said, according to the discipline records, if you are over 55 and now board certified, tend to get into trouble. Now I kind of wanted your comments. Um, can we distinguish, in, I don't know you, I, I think I 
really put you on the spot about this study. But can you maybe help me analyzing whether it's an age or it's an ABMS? Or, you know, just give me your comments on that one. It, Thanks. Is it age as the only factor which well, ended up being the cause for discipline? That was Neil Kahatsu's study. Okay. And it was done through, I think, the California Medical Board when he worked for them. And basically, he looked at several risk factors. So there was age. Uh, there was a question of ABMS certification. There's a series of articles written by uh, Dr. Papadakis from UCSF, which has looked at troubles in medical school. The answer to your question is, I don't know. I am troubled by singling out a single thing such as age, because not everybody we see who's gotten into trouble who comes to PACE or with the Medical Board of California or the other ones is related solely to age, so that young people have problems. We know that if they have problems in medical school, they're going to have disciplinary problems. Uh, board certification is, and I spent a long time with my own board, but also with all the boards. I, I'm troubled by one of the issues, the, the, the notion of what that's about or, and what it should be. In my way of thinking, board certification is a shared responsibility between program directors and the board. That is to say, when someone shows up for a board examination, for four hours, six hours, eight hours, even if it's including an oral examination. That's a very, very small thing upon which to make a decision, especially if that person has been in training for three to five years and observed on an almost daily basis. So that what the program director says or doesn't say about the thing is extremely important and needs to be a more important part of the whole certification process. Okay. I, I can't directly answer it. I just don't believe a single factor is the ultimate. Well, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll talk with you about all the, uh, all the others because the, the MOL, uh, is, although it's an initiative, one of the concept is based on if you're, if you're board certified, you will be automatically meet the maintenance of licensure criteria. So are you trying to tell me maybe that doesn't, well, we'll, 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 we'll discuss that. No, I'm not. I'm trying to tell you that, <laughs> that we're a profession. Okay. And I have sat with the FSMB <clears throat> and ABMS. And as you probably know, there was an initiative that went on, for, I think, four years. or five years ago, where we're working together. That's what we need. That, yes, if you've passed your boards and we're all convinced that that does the right thing, you shouldn't have to go through another thing. What MOL should be, MOL was frankly requiring people to either do what the state said they did or their board said. Right now, as you know, someone who's old like me doesn't have to do anything. I'm grandfathered by two boards. In fact, I am going through maintenance of certification, but just because I feel a commitment to that. But no one is making us do that. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. That's wrong, in my opinion. Okay. Everybody should have to do it. Thank you. And one more, more question. Come on up to the microphone. Oh. Hi, I'm Rob Steele from the University of Wisconsin program. Um, I've got a question for you. I really appreciated your comments and emphasis on scope of practice and practice profiling. Um, there's not a lot of data or literature out there on it that I can find, and I'm interested in it. I was wondering if you have any, um, are you aware of anybody who has expertise or uh, activity? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make an inroad somewhere, but I'm not finding a lot of base to, to jump off of here. I wish I could help you, except to say uh, I can provide you with as much anecdotal information from my personal experience, but there is no good experience uh, in that regard, and that's very problematic in my view. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, if we have Dr. Smith, who is a specialized specialist in X, either self-proclaimed or by an ABMS board, or some other board, AOA board, whatever, and then practices totally out of the realm of that specialty, 
is not that the same as someone who wasn't certified to begin with? Exactly. And I think um, making a, an evaluation you know, pertinent to their scope of practice, I think, enhances the at least the face validity of the process, too, so it's more fair. And I'm all, all about face as a plastic shirt. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Steve. I'm Rosemary Johnson. I represent the retired physicians of the county to the Medical Society Board of Directors. And first of all, thank you for helping me learn and think about new things. It's very exciting. And my question is about retired physicians. A number of us want to maintain licensure. I'm a retired anesthesiologist. Obviously, I'm not going to do anesthesia as a retired physician. So what do we do about testing competencies or maintenance testing or recertification, some of the things you mentioned for retired physicians. I don't mean to infer that, imply that there is a, there are two standards, but I do know a lot of uh, retired physicians want to volunteer, want to help in various situations, and like myself, it's not so much practice, but with public health, community health, public policy, things where being a physician and an edu continually educated physician can really help the community. I, I think that's very important, Rosemary. Thank you. For those of you in, in the interest of true disclosure, Rosemary and I were colleagues for many years. Uh, the, the issue, I'm very excited working with PACE. I've been very excited with Christine and Bill, Norcross and Perry discussing what I consider a fitness for duty. That is to say, if you have a retired physician who wants to do X, we need to develop CME directed to that physician's currency, and evaluation to make sure they're qualified to do X. Then I think that, because basically a license is the ability to go out and practice independently. So, but before that happens, they have to be able to demonstrate that they've had the education, that they're keeping current, and that we've evaluated that so they're good. One of the favorite comments made by my colleague, Dr. Norcross, is that, you know what? Everybody who decides to retire and or this thinks they can do that, and that's just not true. You need to have appropriate education, and it needs to be evaluated to make sure that you have inculcated both the behaviors and the education to be a safe practitioner, whether you're 70 or whether you're 40. Personal belief. One final question, Liz. Yeah, sorry, it's just a more of a comment. I'm Liz Wanghofer from uh, Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. And uh, thanks for, uh, for the great talk. And, and the one thing that I think really uh, stands out is the whole issue of these other factors that are, are potentially drivers of some of the patterns that we're seeing. What we tend to do, or what we've tended to do in the past, is really pick out the factors that we want to look at and see how they impact on performance. The problem with that is we've started to attribute causation to those things as opposed to simple associations. And when we actually start to look at things in a far more ecological approach, in that we're starting to include factors uh, associated with the work environment, health factors, uh, the things that actually make a physician practice in, in a particular context, we start to see that there are, uh, that the actual causation around age or around any one of those factors isn't always the picture that we thought it would be. So for those individuals who are doing this type of research, I really uh, encourage you to take that uh, ecological framework rather than to picking out little pieces and trying to see where uh, associations lie. Yeah, I agree 100%. That's one of the problems with a lot of scientific stuff anyway, is that we have associations, but we may not have cause and effect results. Thank you.